Look at the folks in your community who've gotten vaccinated and are getting back to living their lives, their friends getting together again. Look what we've done, America. There's not a single thing beyond our capacity. Almost 100,000 people are dying globally each week, and we have a chronic vaccine crisis. We will eventually get to vaccination coverage rates that will protect everybody, but we're not there yet. We are simply not there yet. We've seen the tragedy in India. We need to avoid that same tragedy occurring in other countries, and some other countries are heading in that direction. The UK and the US are going to have nearly all adults vaccinated just in about two or three months. The job will be done. We will be lucky if we get our job done in the next two years. Now that nearly half of Americans are fully vaccinated, the U.S. is starting to emerge from the nightmare of COVID. But in India, where only 3% of the country is vaccinated, the nightmare continues. Uh, the last four weeks are really very, very critical for the whole country. We have many, many patients, hundreds of patients are having the respiratory distress. Uh, we are just putting them in the BiPAP support, ventilator support. And in this uh, oxygen crisis period, it is really very difficult for us. We are all having a lot of pain inside. We turned from being almost completely back to normal as a functioning society, even though the cases were climbing, to now a uh, you know, military-grade lockdown, absolutely nothing functioning, completely deserted streets. And the reason we have a lockdown is because we aren't vaccinated enough. It's uh, ridiculous as that. I can't look at the news. I actually am now genuinely scared when people call because it's either hospital bed or oxygen or just worse that somebody's dead. You know, I hear this all very often. The mRNA vaccine works against the Indian variant. And I was saying, what good is it to us if we can't get it today? When we were in the middle, you know, of gasping for breath. So I think in some sense, we were second class global citizens. The Intercept wanted to find out how this vaccine divide emerged and how it might be reversed. To do that, we spoke with these experts who are focused on access to medicines. They say governments can treat vaccines as either global public goods or as private property. So far, they've chosen the latter, and that choice has determined who lives and who dies from COVID-19. You know, everyone understands that rich countries hoarded doses, but I think one thing that gets neglected is how rich countries have also hoarded knowledge. Why should the knowledge that is required to end a pandemic be kept secret? It's a fundamentally bad deal. At the World Trade Organization, countries are fighting over the terms of that deal. Last October, more than 100 countries led by India and South Africa said that patents should not get in the way of vaccinating the world. No person, no country, and no region must be left behind. Their proposed waiver on patents during the pandemic would help make COVID vaccines a public good. But for months, the effort stalled without support from the European Union or the United States, leading to protests in Washington. The waiver will help ramp up global production. It will help increase vaccine access in all these countries that are currently suffering. Until the Biden administration steps up, we will continue to lose lives in the thousands every single day. Organizers here pointed to Biden's statements that he made during the campaign. If the U.S. discovers a vaccine first, will you ensure there are no patents to stand in the way of other countries and companies mass producing those life-saving vaccines? Absolutely, positively. And in May, the Biden administration finally announced it would support negotiations that could lead to a patent waiver on COVID vaccines. The United States is back to exercise leadership and the United States cares about um, uh, saving lives. I mean, it's nice that they announced it by saying, you know, an extraordinary measure for extraordinary times, but it was clearly not extraordinary enough to hurry it up by three months. On the other hand, I think that the, the really good thing about it is that it's a departure from literally the last 25 years of US government policy. Drug companies aren't happy about that shift in policy. Their lobby groups are clear. A patent waiver would jeopardize the industry's core principle. But in order for biopharmaceutical companies to be able to develop these treatments for patients, their discoveries need to be protected. That's where intellectual property rights, or IP for short, come in. 
With me are leaders from the biopharmaceutical industry. For decades, the industry has argued that companies won't take the risk to develop life-saving medicines if they couldn't reap the benefits of exclusive ownership. And if you don't uh, protect IP, then essentially there's no incentive for anybody to innovate. But during the pandemic, it was taxpayers who took risks so that companies might profit. The corporations are getting monopoly control over technologies that have been funded by the public. Consider the case of Moderna, for example. Ten years from now, we're going to look back and realize it was critical for us to achieve our mission. Federal scientists worked hand in hand with Moderna to invent the vaccine. It's literally the people's vaccine. But for now, the people's vaccine remains under private ownership. And while companies will see big returns from vaccine sales, the drug lobby is burnishing its reputation as a savior in the pandemic. The toughest of times brought out the best in us. So while you do your part, we'll continue to do ours. Pharma, our work continues. So now we're in a situation not so dissimilar from where we were 20 years ago in the HIV treatment crisis. The moment it became clear that COVID was going to be a global pandemic, we, it was like a train barreling at us. We could see the same set of issues that were um, going to emerge. HIV and AIDS became a completely treatable condition. It became diabetes, essentially, in 1996, right? A chronic condition that you could live with perfectly well for the rest of your life with simple medication, except where you couldn't afford it, where it was still the same death sentence of 1984 and Rock Hudson. Indian companies could make those same drugs that were being sold for $15,000 for a year's supply instead for a couple hundred dollars. When South Africa tried to change its law so that it could make use of generic drugs, the pharmaceutical industry sued Nelson Mandela. 4664 was by prison normal. Millions of people today infected with AIDS. They too are serving a prison sentence for life. 39 drug companies went to court to protect their patents, while some 2 million people in sub-Saharan Africa died each year from AIDS. At today's protest, the heads of pharmaceutical companies were vilified, as was the American government for its support of the World Trade Organization. So they eventually lost the case. I mean, they eventually withdrew the case because the, the groundswell of anger that it unleashed. HIV medicines, the antiretroviral medicines, did not become available on a large scale until the intellectual property was shared. Let's not do that again. While the world battled Big Pharma over access to HIV drugs, billionaire Bill Gates emerged on the global health scene. Gates believed that philanthropists could join the drug giants to help solve global health crises. We all want to return to the way things were before COVID-19. As COVID became a pandemic, it was Gates who marshaled the vision for a vaccine response. One of the initiatives he supported is called COVAX. The COVAX pillar is founded on the principle of equitable access. Two billion doses would be enough to vaccinate healthcare workers and other high-risk groups. COVAX offers discount prices on vaccines and ships donated doses from rich nations to countries in need. Under this plan, the drug companies retain their ownership of the vaccines. COVAX hopes to vaccinate 20% of the developing world by the end of 2021. But then what? Rich countries all around the world really have no plan to end the pandemic at this point. COVAX has laid the global inequalities bare in a way that even Gates has had to acknowledge. The fact that now we're vaccinating 30-year-olds in uh, the UK and the US, and we're not yet, we don't have all the 60-year-olds in Brazil and South Africa, that's not fair. Uh, but we're going to get to the point of equity. That equity hasn't materialized, and critics say that Gates's vision of a privatized vaccine rollout created shortages from the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, last year when we went into lockdown in April and the news started to trickle in that, you know, Oxford has this breakthrough vaccine. We can get to lots of hard to reach places to get as many people vaccinated as possible. The university first said that they were going to openly license it to, to anyone. It was, it was going to be available for the whole world. We're not protected until we're all protected. Uh, Bill Gates got involved and he wanted to 
shut down any discussion of making the vaccines to the global public goods. And next thing we knew, AstraZeneca had an exclusive license, and then Serum Institute has an exclusive license to produce in India. This quick succession of exclusive deals took a vaccine once promised as a public good and turned it into a scarce product, effectively controlled by one company and produced by another one in India. My God, you had this entire manufacturing base in India, which could have actually given the vaccines to people in India and COVAX, and we just broke the system. The resulting shortages worsened this spring when the Indian government halted vaccine exports in an attempt to address its own humanitarian crisis. Hundreds of millions of doses meant to supply the world would instead remain inside India, leaving the African continent without the doses it was promised. Hundreds of eligible senior citizens over 60 have been waiting at this vaccination centre in Durban since morning to get their inoculations. Fewer than 2% of South Africans have received a jab so far. While countries around the world scramble for vaccines, Gates insists that patent protections are not the reason for the vaccine divide. There's been some speculation that the changing intellectual property rules would be helpful. And do you think that would be helpful? No. Why not? Well, there's only so many vaccine factories in the world. The thing that's holding things back in this case is not intellectual property. There's not like some idle vaccine factory with regulatory approval that makes magically safe vaccines. But the founders of this Canadian pharmaceutical company hope to prove Gates wrong. I don't think only being pharma can do things. It's, it's like saying only IKEA can make furniture. BioLease Pharma says it could produce up to 50 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in a year. It even has a tentative deal to send doses to the government of Bolivia. But to begin production, BioLease needs access to the patented technology. So they've asked the Canadian government to use emergency powers to compel companies to share it. If the government doesn't say, go ahead and do it, we can't do it. It's a dangerous game of, uh, of some type of Russian roulette they're playing with humanity right now. And, um, and, and I don't think it's, it's, it's proper in any way. According to the nonprofit Knowledge Ecology International, BioLease is just one of at least 140 companies around the world that could produce vaccines but aren't allowed to. In this way, the vaccine shortage is artificial. But the human impact of those shortages has been all too real. The world is in vaccine apartheid. And the head of the World Health Organization wants rich nations to do more to help vaccinate the globe. The big problem is a lack of sharing. So the solution is uh, more sharing. The Biden administration is prepared to share doses with countries in need, up to half a billion of them in the next two years. And today, I'm announcing they will also share U.S. authorized vaccine doses of Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson as they become available with the rest of the world as well. But advocates say Biden has the legal authority to share something even more powerful. The Defense Production Act, for example, can allow the Biden administration to require the companies to share the technology, to share their know-how with manufacturers around the world in the name of national defense with a $25 billion investment the Biden administration could help the world produce 8 billion doses of the NIH Moderna vaccine within a year and end the pandemic. If not the entire planet is vaccinated, then we can vaccinate as many rich people as you want. Vaccinating pockets of the world population will not do much. The saying that we, we hear a lot, no one is safe until everyone is safe, it, it is of course true. In India, cases peaked in mid-May, and some parts of the country have lifted their lockdowns. But without a rapid increase in vaccine supply, there can be no return to normal. Do you think you have the course of the It depends on the vaccination. If there are some problems, it will be The power to end the largest global health crisis in a century still rests in the hands of governments like the US. But bridging the global vaccine divide will require a shift in priorities from profits to people.